Good afternoon, everyone. We are very happy that you're able to join us. Uh, we will just get started in another minute or so. We're waiting for a few more people to join us. Uh, so we'll start in exactly a minute or so. Thank you so much. All right, it's 301, so let's get started. Our co-hosts, co Brisbane and B. Atanaj, uh, are delighted to welcome you to this session on collaborations, ushering in a new way forward in India. We have quite a packed agenda for the next one and a half hours, and I hope you will all find the session engaging and useful. I'll quickly go over a few housekeeping points before we get started with the session. We are recording the session so it can be shared with you or some of the others who couldn't make it to the event. If you have any questions for the speakers, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. If you wish to share any other inputs or comments, you can use the chat box, which is a separate feature in Airmeet. If any of you are sharing any comments on social media, please consider using the hashtags charcha2021 and hashtag collaborations along with tagging the nudge and other relevant handles as you see fit. In today's sessions, uh, we will be exploring collaboration from a funding perspective, both in terms of backing collaborative projects with multiple partners, as well as funder collaboratives. The session is divided into two parts. In the first half, we will have a series of presentations, kicking off with a presentation from Preeta Venkata Chalam, uh, followed by a couple of lightning talks, in the second part of the session, we will have a panel discussion with leaders from Indian and global foundations, which will be moderated by Gridspan. So, without any further delays, let's jump right into the session. It's my pleasure to have Preeta Venkatachalam, a good friend and partner at the group. Preeta has been advising governments, donors, multilateral organizations, and nonprofits on a wide range of global development challenges. She's worked on a wide range of areas, including public policy, design and implementation of global interventions, strategy, financial advice, work, and evaluation of programs. Master's degree from LSE and I am Bangalore and is a recipient of the Citibank Leadership Award. Preeta, welcome to the session and over to you. Thanks, Lakshmi. It's a pleasure to be here at Nudge and uh, with Nudge co-host this session on collaboration. Um, i kick off today's session with a short overview of some of the summary insights we had from a study we did in 2019 early to 2020 just literally before the pandemic uh, started on looking at the philanthropic collaboratives across india uh, what we try to do here is to not really necessarily advocate for collaboratives but look at what makes collaboratives succeed what are some of the conditions for them to work and at that point of time, why there weren't enough collaboratives in India. Uh, but ironically, two years down into the pandemic, we are seeing a lot more stakeholders come together, uh, some more usual suspects, but some also less usual suspects uh, to form collaboratives and partnerships of different types to actually tackle the pandemic, both at the grassroots level as well as the macro level. When we did this study, we tried to establish the context of why people are collaborating in the Indian social sector. And to me, really, this um, 
you know, slide captures uh, in a slightly less serious way the logic for collaboration. If we think of every single player in the sector, each of them brings different expertise to the table. No two NGOs are alike, no two funders are alike. Uh, but all of them tackle different and vexatious social sector challenges. So if they all had to take the same exam, let's say of solving the education issue or delivering health uh, to all the poor populations, it's going to be incredibly hard for anyone, despite their resources or skills, to do it alone. So really to bring together different actors, uh, be it government, be it donors, NGOs, research, academic partners, uh, collaboratives was considered a form of partnership for everyone to bring their respective skills to the table. We try to define collaboratives in the Indian context because what we found is that the IP around collaboratives globally really centered around funder collaboratives, which was the most common form of partnerships, particularly in the United States, where three or more funders came together to solve a social sector issue. But what is really unique in India, and we found this pretty much across every single collaborative we studied, was that almost all of them were multi-stakeholder in type. So they were co-created by three or more independent actors, so at least three players to come together. And typically, at least one was a philanthropy that co-funded or largely funded an initiative. It was an entity, need not be a separate legal entity, but it did have a distinct status that brought together resources under one umbrella either within another legal entity or as a separate uh, entity of itself. And what was also unique is that multiple organizations came up with an agreed shared vision and strategy to execute on the social impact agenda, brought together their resources, as well as agreed a kind of governance and organization structure that would then deliver on it. Not everybody was necessarily as active in the collaborative, but everyone played a part towards the agenda. And we found that this definition is unique. Um, let's just give it a second, please. I think Rita's had some network issues. We'll be right back. Sorry, just bear with us. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Preeta is just logging back in. She lost power at her residence, so we just she's just trying to connect on an alternate. All right. While um, while we wait for Preeta to come back. Uh, Perhaps, um, you know, we can interrupt this. Donald, if you're okay with it, we will go to Summer's presentation and come back to pick up the thread once Preeta is back online, if that's okay with all of you. And sorry for this interruption. Um, Summer, if I could request you to um, share your presentation next. Um, I would like to introduce Summer Summers from the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. She's here to share briefly about the Bharat EdTech Initiative. Summer is a program manager at MSDF and leads projects across education and livelihoods. 
She has extensive experience in researching consumer behavior in India and its application to real world social problems. She has a master's degree from LSE and Sciences Po. Uh, the Bharat uh, EdTech Initiative is a collaboration between multiple EdTech companies, non profit partners, and donors to enable at home learning via tech for children across India. The project is anchored by Givindya and Sattva, and the first cohort of students will go live in September 2021. It has a very ambitious target of reaching over 100,000 students in the next 12 months and 1 million low income students by 2025. Samar, over to you. We're really looking forward to hearing more about the initiative. Uh, thank you so much, Lakshmi, and thank you to everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me here. I wanted to uh, put up a small presentation, and Lakshmi, may, could I request maybe the admin to do that? Because for some reason, the share screen button is not working on my screen on my uh, interface sure summer uh, we will be up your presentation just give us a second okay i think it seems to be working now so if you give me a second please go ahead all right so i'm here today to talk a little bit about the bharat edtech initiative i hope you all can see my screen Yes, Samar, it's visible. Okay, so why are we here today? Uh, let me just, you know, maybe just set up the problem a little bit. Uh, it's been about 18 months since schools closed down and our lives got disrupted due to COVID. And, uh, you know, based on the impact of the pandemic and the severity of the pandemic, we know that schools will be one of the, you know, latest or last um, institutions to reopen. And learning uh, remains heavily affected uh, for millions of students in India. Uh, you know, one in five uh, <laughs> of every Indian actually is a school going child today. In the background of all of this, there's actually been like a huge shift in the ed tech market, uh, both in terms of the behavior and, you know, the number of children and parents who are now open to looking at technology as a means for meeting. Uh, learning and also in terms of fund flows uh, we have had almost a, you know maybe a couple of a billion dollars flow into the indian ed tech market last year um, and you know several companies attracting very high valuation and large amounts of funding the problem though is that many of these products still remain focused on a very small part and really the upper end of the market um, you know, in terms of language, in terms of appropriateness, in terms of learning journey and navigation, uh, they remain unreachable and inappropriate for many, many children in India today. I would say maybe the you know, 80 to 90 percent of children today are still not able to use effectively the products which are available in the market. Uh, Price point is one of the reasons, but it's not the only reason, and I'll get into a little bit of that. And that's really where the idea of working together as a collaborative, uh, you know, germinated, and why we felt like this was a problem that was better suited and better attacked if we worked together with multiple partners in the ecosystem. I think, you know, if we are able to unlock that opportunity uh, and find, you know, models that work for uh, kids across, you know, low and middle income households as well, then, you know, we've solved a very important problem for India, which is not just here and now when schools are closed, but also in the long, in the long run. We know that edtech is effective. There are, you know, several studies that prove that, you know, different kinds of technology solution when implemented in the right context can deliver uh, better outcomes. And we also know that it's you know, it's not just effective in terms of outcomes, but it's also very cost effective, you know, for a fraction of the cost of uh, what the government or the private sector spends on a year of schooling and often, you know, at half the cost of what a nonprofit offline learning program would cost, uh, you know, you could potentially deliver the same kind of change technology. Uh, but I think the reason why we need to come together to solve it is that we don't just need more solutions or more content. I think there is a lot of that that already exists today. But the challenge really is on how we make it real for our kids, right? How do we make them use it uh, so that they can improve? And we felt that, you know, collaborative is well set up 
to do something like that as opposed to just funding a new product or funding a solution and driving adoption of that so that we could actually all learn together and accelerate that journey uh, for the indian market who are the you know folks that we wanted to collaborate with and you know what are the types of entities that have actually come together in the bharat edtech initiative uh, you know the first and most uh, obvious suspects are uh, technology solutions so we have several edtech startups uh, you know participating in this collective uh, initiative uh, their solutions stretch across multiple grades uh, you know some of those solutions are content centric some solutions are very uh, practice centric uh, you know they could be focusing on one or more subjects in the learning journey um, and you know we've already identified four high impact solutions that will be launched in the first cohort uh, that lakshmi was talking about which goes live in september the second pillar to this collaborative is really uh, you know the vast knowledge and the ecosystem of uh, non profit partners that we have that have been working in the community for decades uh, many of them you know in the field of education but also several that have been working with parents teachers and you know oftentimes students themselves to mentor them and uh, you know partner with them on their learning journey and i think one very unique point of this collaborative is that really tests how you know both the for profit ecosystem in the form of the startups and the non profits which really have presence on the ground a very sharp understanding of parent and student behavior and can provide an appropriate understanding of what really works in that community um, you know really how those partnerships come to life and we all know that you know india is very large uh, what is needed by a child uh, in an urban school you know in mumbai is very different from if they were in a remote part of chatisgarh or rajasthan and these partners in the community can also provide us that understanding uh, and through these interactions what we want to do is that we want to go much beyond just providing access to a software license and subscription we do want to uh, make sure that there are enough if i can call them nudges but you know enough offline mechanisms to ensure that children are actually using a uh, technology and you know nudges could take different forms and we will customize them and tweak them based on the needs of the community one particular technique that we've seen work very well in the past is actually just send phone calls to you know counselors or mentors who are uh, uh, sort of tagged to every student and make sure that they keep in regular touch with them help them out with any challenges that they're having either just on using the platform or you know if they're having any learning related challenges also then you know how best to continue addressing them uh, we've also managed to actually put together a good consortium of funders and i think uh, you know pratha was talking about this in you know when she was setting up her presentation that a lot of collaboratives are anchored around different funders so yes this is a donor collaborative but you know i think the reason why it comes as third is because i think what's most important is the collaboration between the uh technology partners and the community partners who will really bring the edtech collaborative to life and i think one important piece of information that's really been missing over the last few years is you know like what works and why does it work um and you know if we can really mainstream some of those learnings then we can quicken the journey for many of these products to start getting used effectively by many more children so what we've also done is that we've tried to anchor this collaborative with a very strong uh, you know program management partner as well as an evidence partner who will be able to show us really how usage of different products under different conditions uh, will change the learning trajectory of different types of children and i think with that evidence base we should be able to expand the initiative in years to come and you know, sort of make it much easier for people to collaborate this is just a quick snapshot of uh, you know the partners who were involved uh, so the initiative it's called the bharat edtech initiative being anchored by give india and satva uh, and we have uh, i think almost 15 or 16 organizations that are already part of this uh, you know most of those today are edtech partners as well as uh, non profits who we are actively speaking with and then we have several institutional funders some of these are on the page the others we're talking to and you know, hope to close very soon um 
who will actually be the donors for this initiative. Uh, we're hoping to reach 100,000 kids this year, uh, which is, it is an ambitious target, but I think, you know, we are almost at 70, 75% of that goal. And, uh, you know, we hope to make that in the next month or so with more commitments coming in. But our long-term vision is to reach uh, over a million children by 2025. And we're not really looking at this as a one-year project, but we're looking at this uh, more as, a you know, something that can become like a holding space. Um, you know, I use the word repository, but really a, a place where, uh, you know, if there is somebody interested in using or providing uh, high impact technology solutions uh, at a very affordable price uh, for children who are who need it the most, uh, then they could actually access, you know, some of the understanding, some of, uh, you know, sort of templatized ways of working with ed tech players through this uh, collective initiative. Um, and, you know, our link is there. So feel free to, uh, you know, access that. Uh, you could also reach out to the Give India team. Uh, we're happy to post contact details in the chat. Uh, and I'll also take some Q&A. But we're very excited about this. Uh, you know, it's very unique and probably the first time that it's such a large collaborative effort has been put together in the edtech space. Um, and yes, we're looking forward to a lot of impact uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Summer, and uh, we're really looking forward to see how the initiative unfolds going forward. Um, I think I didn't forget that uh, we had um, a rather uninvited guest. We had Murphy dropping in, which is why Preeta had to drop out. Uh, Preeta, back to you. Really happy that you're able to rejoin us. Uh, I do hope you'll be able to pick up and uh, conclude your presentation. So back to you. Thanks, Lakshmi, and sorry, everyone. Um, Despite the best of intent on technology, uh, Murphy's Law always plays. So in case I do drop off, I know there are uh, tons of practitioners and experts on the panel and doing the lightning talk. So they'll probably bring it a little better than me. But let me try and pick up where I left when the internet dropped at my end. So yes, I was talking about the logic to collaborate. And um, you know, we spoke about the different skills and experience. And 80% of our survey response, you know, Take this as the main motivation to collaborate. Uh, the other big reason that emerged from the survey was about enhancing influence and impact, both through increased attention to the issue, for example, whether it's climate change or migration, as well as increased resources for the impact that they were seeking to achieve together. And the third reason, which was not as popular, but certainly played a role in some of the more quote unquote untried innovative solutions or where due to political sensitivity, it was important for multiple stakeholders to come together and try and address this together. Mitigation of risk uh, that was foreseen in addressing this area. For example, this could be again in climate or independent journalism, uh, as well as other areas where there is a need for a group to try and influence policy and change action. Uh, so these were the three main areas that stakeholders in collaborators chose for the motive to collaborate. We also asked people about what was the real benefit versus the cost to collaborate, because we're all very conscious that collaborating across different organizations takes intense effort and resources. So it is really important that the benefits that you see out of bringing together the power of many exceeds the power of one. And again, these are, of course, uh, there is a selection bias because these are the 13 collaboratives that were working well in 2019-20. But uh, what was interesting is that all of them had come together to try and attack a large and complex social issue. So 71% strongly agreed for that. But when we asked them whether the benefits exceeded the cost, it was a little more nuanced. Over 50% strongly agreed that the benefits agreed cost but about 37% of the collaborators were still on that learning journey. And some of them actually said that the cost to collaborate were, was higher than what they had foreseen at the design stage. So I think cracking that puzzle we found is really critical for the collaborative to stick. Uh, and I'm sure as Summer spoke about EdTech and as many others speak today in this session, I think that you bring out both what is the cost to collaborate and then what's the net benefit of coming together so that those who are intending to come together can learn from both those examples. 
Moving on then to what are the different goals and roles of the collaboratives in India, uh, we found that there were three stages of collaboratives uh, in terms of life stage. Uh, it was taking minimum about one to two years to actually set up and establish a collaborative. Often just single standalone NGOs could be up and running within six months, but collaborators by their nature took longer to cobble together multiple stakeholders, align on the vision and strategy. Uh, so for example, the Tribal Health Collaborative, uh, which was started by Piramal Swastya, which has the Gates Foundation and other partners, took about one and a half years, notwithstanding the pandemic to go live. Uh, similarly, you know, speaking to India Climate Collaborative also took over a year to bring all the partners together, align them on a shared agenda before actually starting operations. Uh, and then in the middle years of two to five, you really try and implement uh, the objectives of the collaborative measure progress and importantly, be prepared to course correct if your goals are not being met. And your five onwards, there are some collaboratives that mature. Uh, some actually dismantle and go back to being individual organizations and others continue on a different trajectory towards their mission. We found during the COVID pandemic that there have been several new collaborators. We just heard about the Bharat EdTech Collaborative, but equally some of these names you see on screen have all been set up and are functioning well literally in the last one year. And while many of them have come up under duress uh, due to either action for COVID or providing timely treatment, you know, what is unique about them is that they are coming together through a mix of funders, nonprofits, sometimes government, as well as often a lot of grassroots organization to take the solutions down to communities and populations in need. And they range from catering to basic needs like supply of dry rations and food, to Swast Alliance, which was providing good health care and medical supplies, to also the RCRC, which is the rural response to COVID, you know, both in terms of livelihoods as well as health care. So you see a whole range of collaboratives that have literally sprung up in the last 18 months or so. And we think that this is now going to be a feature to stay. And how it pans out in hopefully a post-pandemic world is yet to be seen. But certainly, I think the pandemic has brought about a lot of people coming together uh, in a very agile format. And so the two years you saw in the coming together stage has really been collapsed in face of the pandemic to often just four to six, seven months. The typical goals of a collaborative uh, pre-pandemic you know, were to either scale solutions, often because coming together lowered the cost of operations or enabled the partners to reach a much wider geographic area or the population in need. Several of them adopted a field building approach, so more holistically looking at the demand supply side and the policy enabling environment. So the examples you see in the middle tier here approached multiple facets of the field, whether it was knowledge building, uh, communities of practice, demonstration projects in the field, uh, changing policy, etc. And finally, some collaboratives that came together to showcase and ultimately then scale up innovations in their respective sectors. And whether it's nutrition or financial inclusion, several of these collaboratives stayed on once the proven concept could be scaled up and attracted greater funding. The different roles played by the collaboratives range from some of the more quote unquote upstream roles like informing policy or building knowledge right down to implementing programs where the collaboratives actually deploy teams on the ground to reach populations in need. What was interesting in early 2020 was that a majority of the collaboratives at that time did a combination of knowledge building because often as we discussed they were looking at very vexatious tricky social issues which did not have enough research or proven concepts. So they really needed to begin the journey with developing research, developing a body of knowledge, showing that the evidence exists about what works before being able to channel large amounts of funding and going into either facilitating implementation or implementing programs themselves. Uh, also in India, again, given the unique nature of collaboratives, you also see a lot of action on the facilitate implementation pillar because many of them were working with government as a key partner to provide technical assistance, coordination, program management support to really scale impact. So we saw that knowledge and facilitate implementation attracted a lot of collaboratives. Of COVID, of course, you know, the action has been much more diverse and much more closer to the field as well. 
I'll move quickly to the learnings that we saw from collaboratives across the three life stages. And the next one hour of this session following me will give lots of rich examples to bring many of these learnings to life. So in the coming together stage, as I mentioned, the real work of collaboratives was A, to establish why collaborate, and then to come up with the vision, governance mechanism, the results framework, what you're going to be accountable for, and finally, what would be the operating model for the collaborative to reach its impact goals. Moving on to the middle working together stage, as I mentioned, this is where the collaborator was implementing the different programs it was designed to do. And very importantly, many of them were making course corrections within one year or two years, because even the best design strategy in a collaborative format often proved much more challenging when it hit the ground. Different partners brought different things to the table. So a key element of collaborators was for the leadership to be flexible and open to making course corrections to be able to reach the intended impact that they have set. And finally, the agility extended also into the reinvention stage, where sometimes partners changed the goals or updated it, uh, for example, to move from purely implementation to moving to more field building roles or proving some programs on the ground and in their phase two, changing to, say, designing or facilitating policy change with government. So we also saw a lot of agility in reinventing the goals of the collaborative, maybe about four to five years into operation. Through the survey, we tried to find out what were some of the success factors or on the flip side, what are some of the challenges? Uh, and those that are star marked here were much larger number of collaboratives uh, facing that particular challenge or enabling it as a key success factor. So in the coming together stage, and I'd really urge the funders on the panel today to really pick up how you build trust and how you also individually sometimes have to give up your individual funder control uh, in the best interest of the collaborative's goals. And we heard this as a consistent issue from multiple collaboratives where it took longer than necessary to establish trust and ensure that co-partners were still committed but not always had their control. So the sum of the parts had to be greater than the total, but each part had to feel empowered, even if not fully in control of their programs. So I think that was really the top issue and also a key success factor in the coming together stage. Long-term funding, you'll see, is a problem across life stages. So many collaboratives started with sometimes even one third of the intended goal for funding because they had to get off the ground. And a lot of funders said, we'd like to see proof of concept before coming into the collaborative. And once they started working together, getting core unrestricted funding, you'll notice over 50% of our survey respondents were struggling there because they had to function a lot more in terms of managing the program, often having a secretariat, but did not have unrestricted funding sufficiently. And in the reinvention stage, some of them even lost their anchor funders who probably did not want to support the reinvented goal. So you'll notice that funding was a challenge, not just for standalone NGOs, but collaboratives overall. Going back to coming together stage, the other critical area, which again, hopefully the panel will bring out, is about how it's important to define the roles and responsibilities of all the stakeholders involved. And here, this is critical because often NGOs, funders, government, haven't necessarily worked together towards a common goal in the geographic area they have taken on. So, you know, hopefully we'll hear on education, nutrition, healthcare, about how the roles and responsibilities and value proposition were clearly defined for each players in the coming together stage. In working together, a big area that was a pain point was about demonstrating impact. And collaborators, by the nature of solving, you know, big audacious social sector issues, often needed a longer trajectory to actually demonstrate impact. So what you saw in maybe two to three years were more output resulted metrics and not even sometimes outcomes. So a lot of collaboratives needed guidance about how to create winnable milestones that they could report to their funders to keep them still energized to stay in the collaborative. And how do you balance the priorities of each partner with the overall agenda of the collaborative? So for example, we saw that some of the partners came on board because they wanted to influence policy. But that could take more than three years because you often need to build knowledge, show demonstration of what works in the field. And keeping the collaborative going whilst you're striving towards that policy reform 
is a very big challenge in the working together stage. And finally, in the reinvent stage, we found that adapting to disruptions uh, was quite key. And some of the collaborators had to redo their board governance structures or indeed bring new partners into the collaborative as they reinvented their agenda. So finally, I'll leave us with three thoughts, uh, what we call the three Cs. Uh, the first one being the commitment to collaborate. So it is very difficult to prove a collaboration can work in a very short duration. So those who are undertaking it should really be in it for the medium to long term haul, because unless you have like minimum eight to 10 year trajectory, it's very difficult to see results. Second, about having, as I mentioned, clarity and goals, but also constant communication. So I wouldn't underemphasize how much you need to communicate to the multiple stakeholders, whether it's oral or written communication, to keep them on board the collaborative. And finally, as I mentioned, to be able to course correct in case you find that the reality on the ground was different from what it was in the strategy stage. So with these thoughts, I'll um, stop sharing some of the insights we have and hand over back to Lakshmi to go back to the lightning rounds and also to the panel. And hopefully several of the questions that might have come up during this presentation will be answered through some of the practical examples that we'll hear about in the next hour or so. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Preeta. And we, I guess I'm lucky that Internet and Power held up at your end and you could share the rest of your thoughts. Uh, you've given us much to think about. So thank you so much for sharing the findings. Uh, Natasha has now been able to join us. So Donald, uh, we will wrap up the lightning talks and then get to the panel discussion. So it's more, um, it's a more consistent flow. Natasha, welcome to the session. We're really happy you could join us. Um, Natasha is a seasoned banker with about 30 years of work experience in the financial services industry in India and overseas. She's been solely focused on working in the development sector for the past few years, initially with DASRA and now with the India Sanitation Coalition, where she focuses on partnering with investors, grantees and intermediaries, including the government. Natasha, uh, over to you to hear a lot more about the India Sanitation Coalition. Thank you, Lakshmi. Uh, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you so much. Um, could I request uh, them to put up the slides, please? Sure. We're just sharing your screen. Yeah. Right, so um, I, I'm pretty sure everybody knows about the India Sanitation Coalition. And what I'm going to try and do here today is very quickly take you through our journey, uh, you know, where we started five years ago and where we are currently today. So a lot of what Preeta was saying, I caught the, you know, the, the second half of it uh, kind of resonates uh, for us because uh, we are really at the reinventing stage currently. So. Hopefully that should, uh, you know, that should give you a good example of how an organization, a coalition can reinvent. Um, next slide, please. Right. So this is just, uh, uh, you know, to help you understand what we used to be uh, and what we continue to be. Actually, uh, the India Sanitation Coalition started out as an advocacy coalition. Uh, the idea was to, uh, you know, uh, bring out uh, the various aspects of a clean and swatch India. And we use, uh, you know, we use images which are popular in, uh, in, in, in the civic space so that people can understand uh, what we are trying to talk about. So this is just the latest creation that we've come up with. You all must recognize this young boy from North India who has gone completely viral in uh, terms of the song that he sang. So it was just a little uh, meme that we created for people to understand. So, you know, bringing it down to the grassroots level and making sure that uh, you have uh, everyone uh, included in the message. Next slide, please. So this is the journey uh, that we're on. Uh, the India Sanitation Coalition was created about a year after the Swatch, uh, Swatch Bharat mission went live in 2014. It's a FIKI body and represents, uh, you know, a, a coalition between the private sector as well as the government. So in that uh, sense, we are pretty unique because, uh, you know, we do have uh, fairly good uh, relationships with the government, you know, both Mahua as well as uh, Jal Shakti, uh, the Ministry of Jal Shakti. But at the same time, the endeavor is to ensure that the private sector 
uh, uh, both from a funding perspective as well as from a technical perspective, is becoming part of the WASH uh, uh, agenda. Uh, you will all also know that in the first half uh, of SBM, so SBM 1 as we call it, uh, it was the government that did primarily the funding. So, uh, And it was SBM Grameen, which was the rural part, which really went live and was taken to a very large extent uh, in terms of um, execution. Uh, SBM uh, Urban, which was Mahua, was still to open its doors, I would say, uh, to, to some of the projects that uh, we are now currently working on. So with Grameen, uh, we saw a lot of success working with the government, working with the NGOs, working with a whole bunch of other intermediaries uh, and, uh, you know, to uh, put in place the various projects uh, that uh, were envisioned under the program. Uh, having said that, uh, there were also, uh, you know, two main areas of focus that we uh, kind of created for ourselves. One was advocacy of the SPM initiatives, obviously, and uh, its, its messaging. And the second was, of course, the engagement of intermediaries for collaboration. Uh, funding was never a problem. And I know it's a bit uh, strange to say that, but actually for this particular sector, unlike a lot of other sectors, it was really not a problem. Uh, what was a problem was really getting people interested in coming to the table and working together. And that's where the collaborative approach became so necessary. Uh, it wasn't an easy task. Uh, you know, uh, NGOs are used to working uh, for, for today, uh, in today, and uh, thinking about tomorrow becomes a bit difficult for them. But I think we were quite successful. And, uh, and you see some of the results which are coming through, which were primarily uh, on account of all the good work that the intermediaries put in, uh, you know, when in 2019, um, of course, the, you know, officially we are supposed to be 100% um, ODF, uh, which we all know we're not. But to a large extent, Grameen was able to meet a lot of its uh, its uh, objectives. Uh, and I, I, I would just like to mention here that one of the biggest objectives that Grameen was able to meet was around uh, the inclusion of gender. Uh, that's another whole dialogue. I won't go into that, but it's a very, very interesting uh, phenomenon that happened. Um, one of the other things that uh, the foundation does is also uh, you know, we host the annual uh, sanitation awards and those actually help to curry a lot of interest uh, from the private sector because over a period of five years, while there was a token investment that the private sector, and I will call it token because it was exactly that, that the private sector made in uh, sanita water and sanitation, uh, they began to see the benefits. Uh, yes, during, uh, you know, the last elections, a lot of money got diverted and, uh, you know, we didn't see as much coming through the CSR funding. But what has happened now in SPM2 is really what is quite exciting. And that's really where the, I guess for us, the Sedgwe comes into uh, the reinvention. Uh, next slide, please. Right. So these are just some of the endorsements and some of our uh, partners uh, they, you know, we have a, a, a very large group of partners that work with us. But as you can see from, uh, you know, uh, the, the signs that you have over here, we have bankers, we have corporates, we have uh, private foundations, we have um, uh, trusts, uh, pretty much everyone that is in this space uh, works with the India Sanitation Coalition. Uh, from that perspective, we're truly agnostic. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, we, we, we don't really have a particular line that we take, but we look at uh, the SPM directives and try to work along those lines. So frankly, that's really what kind of is the guiding principle with regards to the work that we do. And I think that's really also what makes partners feel comfortable that there's no really, uh, there's no one party line that uh, the coalition, may, uh, you know, kind of adheres to. Uh, next, please. Right. Now, uh, I won't go into these points. I think they're absolutely very, very, uh, uh, you know, rudimentary, but everybody does understand why sanitation is important. I think it became extremely um, um, relevant, uh, if I can call it that, uh, not with SPM 1, ironically, but actually with the beginning of SPM 2 in 2020, because COVID hit us then. And uh, I'm sure all of you have seen the studies which have come out, which tell us that, uh, you know, there is a direct linkage uh, to uh, disease and sanitation or uh, disease and hygiene, disease and uh, health. And that is clearly what um, 
uh, you know, uh, what, what uh, COVID has taught us. So again, the importance of sanitation now has become critical. And uh, if, you, if you look at some, the way some of the states, uh, and now I'll come down to the states because as you know, sanitation is a state subject. Uh, the way the states are actually looking at it is uh, very encouraging where earlier it was, uh, yes, we are going to do it, but you know, the budget when it comes down goes to the bottom of the heap. Now it's beginning to uh, you know, come up the line, up the curve, and we are being able to get uh, even the ULBs to focus around what they need to do with regards to water and sanitation. Next, please. Right. Uh, this is actually ISC's footprint. So a little bit about us. We do three things. We, we do advocacy and branding, as I mentioned to you, a lot of communication. Uh, last year at the conclave uh, was when we actually started to do the evolution or to come into our evolution. And we decided that every year we would have a theme around which all our initiatives would be uh, branded. So last year's theme was gender. And we have our little gender star, Tara who every month, if you look at the website or if you look at our social media handles, you will find that our messaging is done through her. And she actually talks about the various issues which are there uh, either in the rural space or in the urban space with regards to water and sanitation. So she's very critical to all the messaging that we do uh, uh, you know, across uh, this space. Then there is knowledge management and government engagement. Knowledge management is really around uh, the knowledge pieces. So we work uh, with a whole host of partners like WaterAid, IRC, uh, Water.org and others who actually uh, partner with us in bringing out research uh, publications uh, with regards to various aspects of sanitation. One of the, uh, uh, I guess, one of the uh, organizations that uh, ISC sponsors in India is the uh, is Susanna. It's an international platform of uh, of uh, wash specialists, and uh, through them, a lot of research is done in various aspects of uh, water and sanitation. So this is clearly something that we are very, uh, which is very important to us because that really leads a lot of the work that we do. Government engagement, I think it's, um, I, I don't need to stress upon that. That's something that we do uh, all the time. And then there is the private sector engagement. So again, this was a Sedgeway uh, from last year. We've worked in various capacities with, uh, with the private sector. One of the most exciting, and I'll come to that in the next slide, is what we are now engaging uh, the, uh, with them on with regards to financing, private financing. Next slide, please. Right, so this is the slide on private sector engagement, and this is clearly the big ask of SBM2. So SBM2, uh, as you may know, has uh, two very clear specifics. One is sustainability, and the other is uh, uh, funding from the private sector. And clearly, this is a space where uh, even though the government uh, has more than enough financing to be able to meet the requirements of uh, and specifically around the urban piece. I think they're very keen that the projects that are now coming to the table should become commercialized and be standalone in their own right. So sustainable in their own right. And a lot of this has to do both with liquid as well as with solid waste management. Uh, clearly, again, a need to bring in private sector, both from the perspective of innovation as well as financing. So again, a lot of uh, discussions or a lot of intermediaries uh, and partners joining the coalition who have the technical skills and the technical knowledge to uh, uh, bring, you know, to, to make these changes. Uh, you will also know that the value chain of water and sanitation is uh, very largely uh, uh, manual and not mechanized. So again, a large uh, challenge for everyone working in this sector. But what is really interesting is, and we are seeing this in our dialogues, is that the corporate segment is now very keen to enter the space because the ability to raise uh, commercial, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, to make it commercially viable is very uh, is very exciting. The numbers are very very large. So uh, clearly, a space to focus on from a private sector perspective. Um, we do have uh, so the co the coalition is also a part or the knowledge partner to the IFP, uh, which is the Impact Foundation for uh, India, and that effectively has a specific wing for water and sanitation. And there, we actually uh, work with uh, you know different kinds of uh, uh, VCs who are interested in investing in this sector, specifically for startups. Again, a sector which has very few startups, so. Uh, 
uh, lots of encouragement required over here. And we are now uh, putting in place a program where we will be actually uh, having campaigns for people with innovative ideas from the research institutes or elsewhere who would like to actually uh, you know, uh, take their ideas to incubation and then to, uh, to the market. So we're setting up uh, uh, you know, uh, incubator type facilities along with some of the IITs. And that is clearly a space where I'm very uh, interested in, um, you know, in, in taking forward. Uh, I think this is pretty much my last slide. Um, the next one. Uh, Natasha, uh, on, on my apologies, uh, we are a little, running a little behind schedule. Sure, sorry. So with you, we can share the presentation with our audience as absolutely, well. Absolutely, absolutely. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was fascinating learnings, and uh, we do look forward to more work with the India Sanitation Coalition going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just in the interest of time, as we move into the second part of our presentation, I'm going to very quickly introduce our panelists and moderators for this session. Uh, we'll, I'll, if it's okay with all our panelists, we'll be sure, uh, sharing detailed introductions in the chat window. Uh, on the panel, we are delighted to have Gautam John, Director of Strategy for the Rohini Nilakani Philanthropies. We have Geeta Goyal, Country Director for the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation India. We have Nagma Mola, CEO of EDLG Foundation, and we have Oliver Carriers, CEO of LGT Venture Philanthropy. Welcome, Gautam, Geeta, Nagma, and Oliver. We're thrilled that you're able to join us today and share your experiences with us. Uh, the discussion today will be anchored by Donald Ye, who's a partner at the Britspan Group. Donald, over to you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Lakshmi. Um, to start with, it'd be great to just get an introduction from each of our panelists on um, your organization's kind of collaborative pro projects and how you all think about collaboration um, broadly. So it'd be great to just go kind of lightning style through each one of the um, panelists. Um, and maybe we can start with uh, Nagma for a bit of an introduction on, on, on it'll give. Hi, hi, thank you for having me. Uh, no, I'm Nagma. I'm the CEO of ADD Foundation, and uh, we have been running, uh, uh, we have been uh, in operation for more than a decade now. And uh, one of the core DNA of our work is collaboration, while our work, uh, our expertise is in livelihoods, uh, women empowerment, and education. And we're very happy to be here. Great. Um, and maybe quickly um, moving to Oliver, um, I know one of the topics you're interested in is um, thinking about collaboration also across forms of capital, um, but also other forms of capital. So it'd be great to hear from you all how you think about collaboration um, and some of the ways in which you've, you've uh, kind of leveraged collaboration to push forward. Uh, thank you, Donald. Is it okay if I share uh, a, a slide to that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, great. Thank you. Just give me one second. So, uh, <clears throat> good good afternoon. Thank you very much for the the invitation to share some of our insights from our work on on collaboration. As Donald mentioned, uh, do, uh, collaboration slash partnerships, how we like to call them equally, is uh, are really important for us. I think the um, to just set the scene from our experience is that uh, to make collaboration and partnerships work, two key ingredients are necessary. One is uh, the, the broader intention towards a higher social environmental outcome, uh, goal uh, or solution. And the second is of uh, a shared out to agree on a shared outcome. Um, we also, from our experience working across different collaboratives and partnerships, have learned that there's not a silver bullet. So I think it it really needs to be very intentional around the, the solution. Um, I'm the CEO of LGT Venture Philanthropy. We were founded in 2007, and our main aim is to scale solutions to improve quality of life of, of disadvantaged people. And since 2007, we've deployed over 100 million dollars into um, rough over 68 organizations. Our current portfolio in Africa and India uh, stands at 21 organizations. And uh, as I mentioned, for us, it's not just scaling organizations, but the main, o main aim is to scale solutions. And that requires working across uh, different players, so also with public uh, and, and uh, private 
and philanthropy. So here I just want to share four, four examples across uh, two on the capital side which uh, we want to share. So on the left there you see uh, philanthropists coming together to collaborate. Um, we are a member of the, the Big Bang uh, Philanthropy Group that was uh, started by Mulago Foundation, an early stage investor in the States. Um, we currently are at 18 members. Um, we, these, these are all uh, basically philanthropic donors or philanthropic capital providers. And we last, you know, in 2019, the, the members deployed 99 million, and of those, 49 million was actually co-funding, which means if you're a member of this collaborative, uh, you commit to co-fund organizations together, which is great. Um, some of the issues, though, that come up, and I, I will share issues just for, for discussions as, as well, is that, of course, this is a relatively, well, 18 members. Um, there are issues around um, having different opinions on organizations. If you co-fund something, they might not entirely fit your, your strategy, that you, what you want to fit. There are also different ticket sizes. So some funders give in the range of 15 to 20,000. We, for instance, uh, uh, donate or, or support organizations with um, 250,000, sometimes going up even to 2 million. So with that, you have a disparity on the ticket size that needs to be aligned. Uh, and then, of course, you have different timings and, uh, to derive that impact outcome. Uh, so we are multi-year um, patient capital versus some funders might only want to wish to fund for two or three years. But um, our experience overall has been really successful. Um, it's based on trust. So there's a lot of change about things that work. But even more importantly amongst us or the members, there's a lot of exchange about things that don't work. Um, try to reduce transaction costs by sharing due diligence, um, and then, of course, look at specific co-funding opportunities. Um, just as an example, I won't go into details, but happy to expand on it, is a, a collaboration effort between different types of capital. So in this case, it's between um, philanthropy and investment capital in the form of the Educate Girls Development Impact Bond, which you probably all, all know about. Um, here, we've been actively involved in supporting and strengthening Educate Girls for over a decade to actually be ready to be able to implement this bond. And this, of course, is a couple of years ago. But I think there was, was interesting in learnings also around SIBs and DIBs is the, the complexity in setup costs, uh, the timing that has been, been mentioned. Um, and sometimes even I would just put out there the cost-benefit question around being quick and doing plain vanilla grant funding versus this structure, which of course needs to be applied to a certain context. Then on the solution side, two, two examples from our work. Uh, one of our thematic areas is health, where we support primary healthcare uh, initiatives. This is now from Africa, mainly actually. It's the Community Health Impact Coalition. A very exciting and interesting coalition only of operators that work in providing community healthcare solutions. There are 26 of those actually who've come together. Now, normally you could say they are competitors, but in this space, they've come together and actually said, look, let's share best practice. Uh, we all have different implementation models, but let's share best practice to speed up and break out of the silos because what we've also noticed is um, as from a funder perspective, there's a lot of reinventing the same kind of, uh, same kind of solutions. So this is a very effective way to coalesce around uh, one vision, and this is to make community healthcare a kind of global accepted standard, uh, if you will, in healthcare provision. Uh, and this really accelerates the sharing of, of best practice. I think it's one of the few actually where best practice is then collected and actually also fed up to the WHO and a member of the Community Healthcare Impact Coalition um, is invited to the WHO Working Group on Community Healthcare to really see how can we spread out this best practice uh, globally. So really interesting one to look into. Question there is, can we deploy a similar approach for other thematic areas? It needs to be very, very focused for this to work, but um, a very interesting one. So 26 organizations, all implementers across Africa coming together to share best practice. Uh, and the last one, is from our port portfolio organize another portfolio organizations our foundation for ecological security they work in the environmental space or the environmental theme and and here it's actually an interesting one because it's called the commons collaborative 
Um, and this is with the aim to move from the strategy of the commons to the promise of commons um, by actually creating a partnership platform to mainstream the commons management for livelihood enhancement and ecosystem restoration. Now, here we see it's a, a broad topic, um, but it's really exciting around sharing key data, different data sets, and for different partners to collaborate. Um, here are some of the questions to look into is time requirement to actually have a strategic alignment because the thematic focus is relatively broad, of course. It's a crucial topic to get right in these times, but um, time alignment is a question. And then, of course, it's the quality of partners, uh, the, of the implementation partners that are part of this collaborative, because at the end of the day, it's those that actually implement the solutions that need to vouch for the quality outcome. So these are just a, a couple of, of uh, examples across the spectrum on capital and also how um, or, um, implementing organizations help to scale solutions. Back to you, Donald. I hope that was a, a good sort of tour d'horizon. Great. Thank you, Oliver. Um, and maybe quickly, Gotham, it would be great to hear from you um, how uh, Nilikani philanthropies you all think about collaboration and a, a few examples of that as well. Sure. Thank you, Donald. Uh, thank you for putting this panel together. Um, between Preeta and the lightning presentations, I think we've learned a lot about collaboration, and I'm wondering how much unique value the rest of us can add. Uh, but we'll try. Um, to us, uh, philanthropy is really anchored in an act of love, and we believe that collaboration is change in action. We tend to do collaboratives around two kinds of models. One is collaboratives in domain-specific areas. So, for example, in media, and Nagba and I work together in a collaborative um, on climate. Uh, but we also have collaboratives around methods. So, for example, we um, are partners of a global fund called Co-Impact, which is around systemic change. So we, we, use, uh, we use collaboration to, to accelerate four types of journeys for us, access to learning, access to pipeline, catalyzing capital for scale and for efficiency mechanisms. And we do so in two distinct buckets. One is around particular domains and one is around particular methods. So yeah, so that's where our collaborative journey is. Great, thank you, Gautam. And Gita, I can't, Gita, are you able to come on? Yes, I'm here. You can hear me? I think she, she might be, um, Having connection problems. So, um, Gita, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, Donald. Oh. Gita, you may want to begin because I think only Donald can't hear you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was messing. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, Donald, why don't you put the question? Are you here? <laughs> okay, I'll begin. Okay, so just as an introduction, uh, I'm with the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. This is Michael Dell's personal philanthropy. Uh, we, uh, you know, the mission of the foundation is improving lives of children and youth in urban low-income communities. Uh, in India, we've been in the country since 2006, and we work across three programs, education, livelihoods, financial inclusion. Uh, as a core principle, I would say the foundation has a bias towards ac action and execution. So, you know, is a majority of our work collaboration based? No, uh, I would say uh, it's only a small portion of our work, which is collaboration based. And where we used collaboration is uh, pilots, we believe is more individual action. So pilot projects, no. Uh, scaling up also most of the times we believe is individual organizations which need to scale up so so even in scale up mostly no uh, but when it comes to systems change or saying that we need the power of more than one or more than a few to you know create a change that goes beyond this set of organizations uh, we need more change at the ecosystem that's when we've adopted collaborations uh, and I would say uh, maybe there are four types of collaborations we've done. Uh, one is at the industry level. So we've been a long time funder of uh, CGAP, which is a global collaborative of funders in microfinance. Uh, it's a longer term collaboration. Uh, we were also the one of the incubators of Impact Investors Council, which is an industry association of uh, impact investors. So again, a long term collaboration. Uh, again, within the microfinance space, 
uh, we had helped set up Responsible Finance Forum, which, as the name suggests, was you know collaboration of funders and practitioners to start adopting more responsible practices. It was set up as a long-term forum, but quickly uh, moved into MFIN, uh, which is their industry association. And then, you know, on the industry side, I had forgotten, but Preeta's presentation reminded me we were also funders of CDFI and the Education Alliance. Uh, so, so yes, I think we have several collaborations on industry. These are long term. These are, you know, don't start with a specific objective. They may have a specific vision. Uh, and I would say we've had a mixed bag of success and learnings from them. And, at, you know, at times there has been more action. At times there's been less action. The second type of collaborative is, again, you know, what uh, I think Preeta referred to, which really came about post the COVID crisis. Uh, and there again, we are funders with uh, funders of Migrant Resilience Collaborative of the Action COVID Task Force, ACT, uh, and also the Revive Collaborative. Uh, and I would say all of these came together, you know, to meet a specific need to react to the crisis, get funding pools quickly, get action on the ground quickly, get decisions quickly. It's been a year, they're all working well. Uh, and let's see, you know, whether they morph into long term uh, collaborative or not. Uh, the third type of collaborative, I would say, are collaboratives which are for a specific purpose. Uh, so the Bharat EdTech collaborative that Summer spoke about is that we have some evidence base on EdTech tools. Now we want to both scale it up and create more evidence base and get more players, you know, both practitioners as well as funders into uh, this space. Uh, so, so that's one example of a purpose-specific collaborative. Uh, similarly, we are part of the life skill collaborative, where the specific purpose is for funders and practitioners to come together to really, uh, you know, identify and curate a set of standard assessment frameworks. So, very specific. It's not even interventions in life skills. It's just assessment, so that we can all coalesce around common vocabulary, common tools. Uh, similarly, with uh, Yuva, which is an incubator of UNICEF, we've put together a collaborative, which is more like a sandbox of interventions on life skills, which can be delivered now in COVID times in a low facilitation way, but mapped to similar assessment standards so that, you know, at the end of six months, uh, we really know which uh, projects are scalable or which aspects of these interventions are scalable and low cost. Uh, and, and then, of course, there are project specific collaboratives like impact bonds, etc. So so I would say it's the whole spectrum and each of them, you know, while they're different success metrics, different periods over which we evaluate the success. Uh, I mean, I feel that there are I mean, I think Preeta referred to three C's for the success of a collaborative. Uh, I always say it's four C's. The analogy is more like a diamond because, uh, you know, it shines brighter if you the stronger the four C's are. Uh, again, similar to Preeta's, I would say uh, it is, you know, the first is clarity of vision and of specific milestones and metrics because sometimes the vision is long drawn, but you really need to see action uh, and, you know, success in, in shorter bursts so that you build on the alignment of trust. Uh, the second, I would say, is commitment. So really placing the collaborative over the organization interests. And again, you know, I think we have a lot of, uh, you know, different funders come with different viewpoints, different hypotheses, different theories. Uh, but for the collaborative, there's a specific reason why we've joined together. Uh, so um, taking... Out. Yeah. So, so yes, I mean, you know, the commitment of the organizations to place the collaborative over the organization for that specific purpose is important, both at a leadership standpoint as well as a management standpoint. Uh, the third, I would say, is content and consistency. Again, you know, action needs to keep happening. We need to keep seeing success in a consistent manner you know, cannot have bursts of like no activity for 12 months, 18 months. Uh, and fourth, I would say is communication, extremely, extremely important, you know, bilateral, multilateral, small groups, big groups. I think collaboratives are successful if there are enough forums for communication and dialogue, and that really builds the trust. Uh, so I would just say, yes, the four C's are not unique, but I think 
coming together in a way uh, it really helps build the agenda forward uh, and the moment we start seeing any slip ups i would say you know from a diamond you go to a rock and sometimes these rock becomes roadblocks or boulders in progress and that's the time collaborative should stop or revisit or you know pivot uh, but it's extremely important to keep seeing uh the success or the effectiveness of collaboratives because they do take a fair bit of time and resources uh but if they succeed then they deliver you know 10x 100x of the impact that you expected so so yes it's a double edged sword great thank you so much geeta for sharing um one of the comments in the chat that i want to pick up on is some some people were asking about what examples of benefits of collaboration so it'd be great um for you all to reflect on maybe one kind of concrete example where collaboration allowed you to achieve impact that would not have been possible kind of uh individually and maybe I'll start with Nagma again because you gave you gave a very quick introduction so <laughs> a little more space uh to to share on this one no i i think there's a lot lot to benefit um i think co-learning Uh, just having just going through a, a shared experience together very focused on a common goal uh, in our in our own institutions we kind of tend to go uh, organize uh, you know as per organizational mandate and uh, really follow our own purposes i think collaborations are actually fantastic for teams because what one learns with working with each other uh, one cannot learn alone having said that of course there are some incredible uh, benefits of coming together and making you know a 10x kind of an impact our first collaboration on education was able to scale from 25000 children to you know 1.5 million children in under 2 years uh, we couldn't have even imagined that alone right because of the scale of imagination the scale of uh, uh, of of funds and and of of expertise that is needed but we have some incredible partners and they took the journey forward and they made it happen and uh, i think that's when we realized that there is so much sense uh, in collaboration in working with more people listening in to them having said that donald because you know i i i also see we are running short of time i'd also like to say that from the first collaboration to our sixth one now where you know uh, we've we've been part of uh, you know pwit we've been part of the icc with uh, gotham we've been part of mrc with you know geeta so uh, some fantastic uh, fantastic partners on ground but i'd also like to say that collaboration is not for everyone and i keep repeating that you know there has to be a real sensitivity towards the cause and a desire to do whatever it takes to move forward you know because collaboration is more more than just coming together collaboration is the giving away of power uh, and the giving away of uh, of of what we think is right all the time and it's about uh, about coexisting and and really thinking no this is more than us so whatever pains it takes we we'll go through this together and and uh, i I'd, i'd like to place that very consciously uh, we are working on grow right now we're working on something that a year ago we would have thought was too ambitious but it is coming together not just because we had a great design but because we had people who believed in us and who also guided us when we've been making uh, you know uh, conscious decisions on how to do this or that or going on making forward we're hoping to make a big dent with that so i just pause with that but uh we we've learned a lot in collaboration uh, the impact is immense uh we cannot move fast alone we can move really fast together but yes anyone getting into collaboration must also get in with the entire commitment that it's all not fun and roses it's actually a very i call it sometimes the tooth extraction without anesthesia it is that but it's so worth it <laughs> no but one has to be very conscious that this is not fun and games this is a uh, very very important and it's worth the trouble Be picky up on that point, and I we are a little bit short on time, so I'll kind of roll <laughs> through a few other questions, including from the Q and A. It be I I'm curious if any of you have considered collaboration have considered collaborations in certain areas, and they decided it wasn't worth the effort because it, there is a cost to collaboration, and are there times when um, your organization has decided it it makes more sense to do something more kind of on your own versus try to. Um, and not necessarily on your own but not through a formal collaboration that the kind of effort wasn't worth it so I'll open that that one up to the group if 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 anyone has reflections on that question what well, if anyone else is not taking up i think that comes up more often than not finally we're working on a limited number of collaborations all of us 
and uh, that is that it's not because there's no opportunity it's because there is a right time and a right way to do some things and all ideas don't have to be uh, go on sometimes we need to take that solo risk and invest in some things ourselves uh, geeta you want to add yeah no i was also just saying that there's a time and place so there are no examples of you know ideas we thought we will start as a collaborative and then stepped back but i mean there are uh, several ideas which we know that you know, it's a pilot or it's a scale up we need to do this on our own this is not ready for collaborative and at at some stage it will be so so yeah i mean and i was also reflecting that you know in the last two years we've supported a lot more collaboratives than in the past uh, of course it's a function of covid and some you know crisis related collaboratives but also it's a function of our own journey in our learning and our evidence base and you know now being ready to say let's be part of collaboratives and drive it at the systems level just then one one observation from our side i think collaborative need to be put into the stage of the sector um and what what we seen specifically uh in the africa context and the difference between africa and india is like in africa there's a just a lack of local implementers and then it's a bit of becomes a bit of a trade off do you you know invest time and effort into collaborative which is a systemic more of a systemic approach versus devoting time and resources to uh, developing to doing direct investments and developing organizations that then can implement it and i think that's a that's a uh, uh, careful balance that one needs to strike as a funder because it it does as we heard it's complex it takes time there needs to be alignment and if ultimately if if the issue that we're facing is is now and the funding is now we we focus primarily on the organizations on the implementers and there has to be a very strong case for why joining a collaborative you know uh, allows us to do more a- amplify the impact devote more resources learn more break down silos so there needs to be an additional some strong arguments to then say okay let, let's add the collaborative to it um versus focusing on on helping organizations scale and grow thanks for sharing that oliver there are a bunch of questions in the q and a which are more about some of the kind of nitty gritty of how to bring this to life so i'd love to dive into that and get um kind of practical here um so one of the questions really is around um the ability to course correct so one thing we've kind of heard from preeta was like the ability to course correct is really important in the life stage of a collaborative particularly ones that are might be looking at riskier or early stage areas and yet um collaborate that can be difficult in the context of a collaboration where you've worked so hard to align so many different stakeholders so it'd be great to get perspectives on this group about how you all have thought about kind of course correction um in the context of collaborations and maybe some examples where of where that's been necessary and how you've you've been able to navigate that in in a collaborative structure so I'll open that one to the group as well i can go uh, donal and give some quick examples both uh, i would say in the context of covid uh, one was act and you know they started with uh, some uh, you know mandates around uh, testing tracing as the crisis unfolded or settled down they started doing other you know i mean they just responded so from preventive it became to cure to you know now vaccinations uh, but really when i would say before our wave 2 when covid subsided when they started talking about building healthcare capacity you know creating more uh, feet on street models and catalyzing that i would say that was a course correction or not a correction but a pivot uh and uh, and it wasn't a challenge because again of the continuous communications they were doing with the funders with the stakeholders there was a logic to do it uh in the case of revive again it started more as an msme financing like you know quick credit uh, or returnable grants to micro and small enterprises um and then you know realizing the need for it they started adding skilling or upskilling to it it was it was definitely distinct from where we started uh right there is an echo or a feedback okay is it better now uh okay so uh so so yes i mean you know the the correction from saying purely from returnable grants can we add skilling to it uh 
again i would say to begin with there was resistance from some of the early funders uh, but then realizing the need for it and what you know the power of multiple new entrants could bring to the table i would say uh, you know the 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 funders and the stakeholders agreed to it it was a consultative process um, but uh, i mean i would not say it was challenging uh, but it was not as smooth as one expect uh, as we would have thought if we were individual funders yeah. thank you um there's a question here, and may, I'll open it to the group, but um, maybe have Oliver lead with the answer given his, um, where he sits. But um, about how do you balance the interests of, of profit-seeking enterprises and social kind of um, kind of grant-seeking, more traditional grant-making in a collaboration, especially in areas where there might be kind of disconnect between the the, the kind of incentives for the for-profit and um, profit-seeking and kind of nonprofit funding. I, the, I mean, this is where, where the whole um, results-based payment system structure comes in, right? Between uh, outcome funders where, who are primarily motivated by max, well, optimizing for social, for social or environmental returns, be it government or, or philanthropists versus uh, in, investors that have a certain risk appetite. And the, the example with the SIBs or even in the, the different DIB structure is to align those investors coming in for specific periods and also you know the outcome fund the the risk taker essentially pays up for the upfront risk and is then rewarded at the end if the social impacts are actually achieved or exceeded or not uh, the return is actually adjusted to the social outcome which is then paid by the philanthropist or government or any other kind of outcome payer um what we've seen in those structures is there's a huge appetite for, from the investor side, uh, risk-seeking capital, and um, the challenge is, is to align the outcome payers um, around that. But we've seen these structures work. I mean, in Cape Town, we supported one on, on early childhood development in the Western Cape, um, where we were, um, in, in, as an investor, essentially, and the outcome payer was government. So I think one just needs to be very clear and honest about the alignment uh, and the roles and responsibilities in those structures um, and, and how those are, are triggered, and then they're doable. They're complex, but I think it's, it's what needs to be very, very open, and then um, align around the, the principles of, of, of doing these type of risk, risk-adjusted risk investments and linking them to social outcomes. Donald, this is Natasha here. Could I maybe just give an example that's actually working quite well in India? So if you look at, um, if you look at uh, what uh, Grameen has done, in some of the sectors, education particularly, I think they've done it in agri as well as in livelihoods. Uh, they've created what are called the social bonds, which are quite, uh, which are quite interesting because the size of the bond is very small. Uh, it fits very well with the requirement. And essentially uh, you have, uh, so Grameen becomes the, uh, the investor and uh, you have the outcome funders who then aren't um, expected to give a fairly large amount uh, to, uh, you know, to be able to buy the outcome. So there's a bunch of outcome funders that come together. And it's, it's, it's an interesting model. It's working really well. The one sector which they had uh, not been able to enter into was uh, sanitation, water and sanitation, given the size of some of our projects. But uh, we are actually on the anvil of being able to announce one. We're hoping to do it a little later in the year in October. So I think, uh, you know, uh, collaboration is really something that uh, that can work. It can work if we're very clear on the roles and responsibilities of the collaborator, be it the funder or be it the fundee. And uh, if that is not clear, then honestly, it, um, you know, it just fails. Uh, you know, for an organization like ISC, uh, we can't exist if we don't collaborate because that is the, you know, that's the bottom line for us. We either we collaborate or we die. So uh, that is clearly something that uh, we have to practice with every single one of the initiatives that we work in. And I do agree with most of the uh, speakers today that it's the, one of the hardest things to do, uh, to let go of an idea uh, and say that, you know, I'm going to let the control go and let somebody else, you know, into my, into my space because my, this is my idea. But um, over a period of time, you begin to get a little better at it. It's just a question of practice from my perspective. Yeah. 
Great. And maybe one final question that um, uh, we probably have time for one or two of you to comment on. So there have been a few questions in the chat um, in the Q&A about um, how you all think about kind of discretionary funding and capacity building in the context of a collaborative. So um, I think this is a question around both how do you think about raising money for the kind of discretionary or operating um, costs of a collaborative and also how do you have you thought about structuring for capacity building needs uh, within a collaborative so it'd be great if a couple of you could comment on that I think donor it has to be part of the initial design I, I think it becomes very simple if uh, things become not very simple. I don't think anything is very simple, but things become much simpler if these things are articulated and designed, purchased, and, and included in the original design itself. Because anything that is an add on or an afterthought uh, doesn't neatly fit into the collaborative. When we design a collaborative or when we are thinking of you know where, how we move forward, uh, that space has to be given due respect that there are going to be costs that are, uh, you know, are warranted or unexpected. And there's going to be some serious capacity needs of uh, not only the, the the other players, but also sometimes of our own teams. And uh, I, I mean, I see the only, only uh, real solution is that when we are designing for these problems, we have to include our own capacities, how we're going to work on them, and as well as capacities of all the partners here as we move forward. It has to be a conscious plan. Thank you, Nagma. So I think we're running towards the end of our time. Thank you all um, for participating in this panel. I think it's been really insightful and really great to kind of see here how these collaborations have led to greater impact in practice. So thank you for sharing your perspectives. And I'll turn it back to, to Lakshmi to close out the session. Sure. Uh, Donald, um, I'm just uh, giving a heads up and the opportunity. If you have any further questions you'd like to have, uh, ask the panelists, please go ahead. I think we can take a few more minutes. Um, just probably one or two last questions. But if there are, if you've covered most of the questions from our audience, um, we could head towards that. Maybe I'll, I'll, there's one more question in there that I'll, um, I'll tee up to the group then. Um, there's one around, could you give any examples of um, kind of failure episodes in experimenting with collaboratives and what were the learnings? So um, I'll open that up to the group of either failures or just things that didn't go quite as planned. I, I think sometimes um, failure feels like a high bar, um, but just things that didn't go as planned and uh, any learnings you have from in retrospect on those. Yeah, I can go, uh, Donald, uh... And I, I won't name the collaborative, but I would give the example. Uh, so, so I would say, uh, you know, in a, in a three-year collaborative effort, things shifted within the first year by six months. Now, that is a significant shift out, uh, given uh, just the short-term uh, nature and the short-term objectives of the collaborative. And and really, what did not work was, uh, I think the the speed of action required by part of the collaborative and the importance of alignment and you know just the time it took for alignment building uh, uh, within the collaborative and and i would say for us that was a, a very big learning saying that upfront you know budgeting enough time enough and more time to create those communication spaces to create the alignment uh, and and therefore build the trust out uh, is important. So, so yes, it did not meet its first year objectives. Uh, but I would say from, you know, the, the potential success, we are on a much stronger footing, because I do believe that there's there's a much higher level of alignment amongst, uh, you know, practitioners, funders, etc, who were who were sitting on very different footings. And, and now for the sake of the collaborative, I would say, are, are uh, you know, more together, more behind the objective, uh, and definitely help creating trust. So, so yes, I mean, it's, I would say if you say the failure in terms of timeline, uh, but I think a significant learning in terms of uh, alignment. And uh, just just to build on that, uh, from, from Gita's point, one, we are we involved in a, in a large scale education collaborative. And what has been very interesting is around timelines. Um, and 
if you work in education, you know, and, and you ha you're aiming for educational outcomes, you have to build in quite a long period of time. The challenge that we are facing at the moment in the setup is that we've, we've got the evidence for these educational outcomes, but what has happened in the meantime is that the policy of that outcome funder, it would be a mul large multilateral donor, has shifted. So we are suddenly faced with a situation where we've got these educational outcomes and the partner who was initially there to then say, okay, once you have those outcomes, we'll come and pick it up, take it over from philanthropists and fund it. Uh, suddenly we're faced with a policy and focus shift that was unforeseen, which also leaves the local government in a bit of a pickle. And we're now, we're now in a very interesting sort of space where we're saying we've got all the, we've got all the building blocks here. But we're faced with with a, a, a macro change um, that no one has could have uh, foreseen. And now the question is, what are we going to do this now in this interim phase? So I think I just want to highlight not as a failure, but as a risk around aligning different time horizons between philanthropists and the actual time it takes to validate and verify an impact. That's why we're here for. That's why we have collaboratives. But that it might be disjointed with the timelines of the different funders and players that are around. Um, that sit around the table. Thank you. Any other reflections from the others? Or if not, I can turn it back to Lakshmi to close out this action. Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in here, Donald. And this is a discussion I was having with Lakshmi earlier uh, on, you know, funder collaboratives and the role of nonprofits in it, and whether you know, even from a governance structure, how do you build in that voice? Uh, and just two examples I would give here. Uh, one is CGAP, which I said was you know the global collaborative for microfinance, but it was a funders collaborative in their five-member advisory board. I would say they were very conscious that there were at least one or two practitioner members. Uh, so in fact, Vijay Mahajan from India was on the advisory board and I think he was even the chair uh, of a funders collaborative. So, so I actually think, you know, that's, that's a great example of how you build in practitioners. Uh, and again, in our uh, life skills collaborative, there are five funders, 10 practitioners and, um, uh, We've created a steering committee, which is actually a revolving steering committee, which just gives an equal representative voice uh, to both funders and non-funders. And, and, you know, sometimes I don't think it's the importance of saying, hey, we don't have a non-profit or we don't have a practitioner. I think for a collaborative, it's just important to blend different perspectives. In a lot of our work, you know, the different perspectives are from the market the funders, you know, the practitioners, as well as the government. So uh, as long as, you know, plus anything else that is relevant, but I'm just saying it's uh, it's important that those voices get represented in a governing structure, board structure, or whatever. Great. Thank you for sharing. Um, and thank you all again for um, sharing your perspectives. Back to you, Lakshmi. Thank you, Donald. And thank you to all of our speakers and our audience members. I think really great questions and thanks to all our speakers for sharing some very sharp insights with us. I hope all of you found the session interesting and informative. Uh, I'm sure there are a couple of questions that we didn't get around to answering. We'll try and connect with you, the, the, the members in the audience, to try and respond to them after. Uh, we look forward to staying in touch and continuing this dialogue. Uh, thank you, Donald, for uh, asking all the right questions and holding this panel together. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to share that we do have another interesting session on collaboration coming up uh, in about 30 minutes. Uh, Danya Radhendran, who's the editor of the News Minute, will be leading a discussion on the role of collaboratives during the pandemic. Uh, we have members from ACT Grants, the COVID Action Collab, uh, the Migrant Resilient Collaborative, uh, as well as uh, Shrimati Uma Mahadevan of the Government of Karnataka uh, will be speaking about uh, how they all work together to respond to the pandemic. Uh, so we hope to see all of you at 5 p.m. Thank you so much and have a great day.